Today, is credit about to crater? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and prop news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, you may have noticed that we've hit the end of April and as yet I haven't reviewed the latest statistics from the RBA and from APRA. And there's a simple reason for that. I've been too busy dealing with a whole bunch of requests from various media sources relating to the mortgage stress and the financial stress statistics. It's so relevant given the high inflation and concerns about interest rate rises. But nevertheless, I have put my stats fest together. And so today I want to take you through the latest statistics. And by way of a little bit of a precursor, let me just refer to this statistic, which was shown on Insider this morning. It relates, of course, to mortgage stress and also rental stress. And if you have been following my shows, you'll recognise this data. It's mine. So it was up in lights this morning. And here is the underlying data that shows that mortgage stress has moved up to more than 42% of households in financial difficulty. This is measured in cash flow terms, of course, money in, money out. And rental stress has now overtaken it. Over about 42% of renters are also struggling. So the costs of living issues are real and getting worse, something which I'm afraid is still hardly being addressed in the current discussions around the election. Now, OK, Labour did make a specific announcement today about 10,000 households per annum being assisted by a proposition where a section of your equity is provided essentially by the taxpayer. In other words, a shared equity scheme. Very interesting to encourage people to buy in right at the top of the market with very little equity of their own. This is crazy, crazy. And of course, all of these stimulus schemes from either side of politics will drive home prices higher. This is one of the big fallacies. None of these sorts of initiatives actually really help. It simply drives prices higher, so more people have to pay more. There is no strategic analysis of the underlying issues, unless, of course, you come and listen to DFA. And indeed, next Tuesday, Steve Keen, Professor Steve Keen, who's standing for the TNL, and by the way, who has a very coherent policy on housing affordability, and property prices will be on my show. So Mark Yudarian, come and join us for that. Anyway, now back to the data. And we will start with the Reserve Bank data, the financial aggregates. Now, of course, this is up to the end of March, so it's a bit delayed. But nevertheless, it shows that overall housing credit in the last month rose 0.6%. Personal credit fell slightly and business credit grew 0.3% compared with 0.8% last month. And that takes us to an eye-watering growth rate of 7.9% for housing credit over the last 12 months. Comparing it with a fall of 3.3% for personal credit and business credit a rise of 9.4% giving a total lift in credit of 7.8%. Now, I want to highlight before I move on just a very important observation because they said, of note this month, owner, occupier and investor credit has been resized by more than usual owing to the resubmission of data and the re-estimation of a seasonal factors. This has affected growth in owner, occupier and investment credit in RBA statistics table one. That's the one we're using and the levels of those credit stocks in RBA statistical table D2. Aggregate housing credit, which includes both owner, occupier and investor credit, was not affected by these revisions. Now, it's worth just looking at what this is all about, because essentially what's happened is that data specifically from Westpac has been restated. So there's been a shift away from investment to owner-occupied data for that particular bank, 
this month, and I'll come on to that later because, of course, it does change the trajectory of both the owner-occupier and investment markets being one of the big four. So I'm afraid, once again, you see some fuzziness in the numbers. No surprise for those watching the channel. Anyway, now let's look at the data in more detail. So firstly, we'll look at the monthly aggregate growth. And we start with overall housing, which was up 0.61%. That's lower than a couple of months ago. So there's a little easing at the moment in terms of overall credit for housing. Within that, owner occupation drifted down to 0.57% growth, still up, but not quite as strong as recently. And investor lending up ticked slightly to 0.62%. So in fact, the movement in investment lending was higher but that may be some of the restating that we mentioned a little while ago, also having some impact. Personal credit fell 0.17% in the month, and business credit dropped. It was up 0.27%. So we've seen a drift down in business credit over the last three months. I think that's a sign of things to come because of the levels of uncertainty and the concerns about supply chains and also inflation. Now, we can also look at the overall credit aggregates in terms of all credit. So total credit growth was 0.45%. So you can see that's a considerable drop from that a little while ago. Whereas broad money was up 0.77%. So we actually have more money flowing into the system than credit growth. That is partly, of course, continued government support and also a sign perhaps of more inflation ahead. Now, moving on to the aggregate annual numbers, which is a more realistic review of what's going on, housing credit grew by 7.86% over the last 12 months. Owner occupation was up 9.15%, a very, very strong, but you'll see it sliding back slightly from previously. So it does look as though credit is on the turn, but investment housing lending was up 5.32% over the last 12 months. And that, of course, is the considerable momentum now gaining in some investment properties, although you would have to suggest that this may turn quite quickly now, given the latest information from the markets. Personal credit was down 3.28% over last year. And business credit is still pretty strong at 9.4%, but is tipped down just slightly in recent times. And then if we look at the overall credit levels, growth in credit is 7.83%, just down slightly from last month. So there's a little hook in the curve. Be interesting to watch that trend ahead. My suspicion is the movement down will be accelerating from here. Whereas the broad money is still at 9.52%. So once again, we are seeing more money sloshing around and flowing to the economy, which will drive inflation higher. And just before I finish the review of the RBA data, we'll look at the three month credit trends because those trends are quite interesting. You can see there that housing is at 1.88, so it's down a little. Owner occupation is 1.97, down a little. And investment housing over three months is at 1.66%, so that's going sideways. So there is definitely the first signs potentially of a cratering in housing lending. Personal credit's up and down a bit, down 0.64% over the last three months. Although ahead, my suspicion is that we will see more people reaching for credit cards and other forms of credit to help them get through the cost of living rises, which of course have been very strong. 5.1% annual inflation is a bit of a killer. And then business credit was at 1.66%, which is lower than the last few months. Now let's turn to the APRA data, which is the monthly authorised deposit taking institution statistics. So this gives you the total stock levels for the ADIs, the banks, essentially, that APRA are responsible for reporting on. And again, it's up till the end of March. We start with the overall change. So owner occupation was up 1.7%. But investment lending was down 1.62%. Now, that's because of the very considerable shift between investment and owner occupation 
from Westpac, as I'll show you in a moment. So you can't really take much from those statistics. The overall growth, though, was 0.58%. So again, we are starting to see a bit of a cratering in terms of new lending. Still strong, but not as strong as the last couple of months. Another way of looking at it is to say that the total stock outstanding is another record of $1.97 trillion. Very large numbers, of course. And within that, the growth in unoccupied loans continues to move faster than investment loans. And because of the Westpac adjustment, the percentage of investment loans outstanding across the ADR has dropped quite considerably. It's now at 33.14%. Now, this is where we get into the momentum created by the Westpac move. So you can see that there was a very strong uptick in unoccupied lending and an offsetting downtick in investment lending from Westpac. Put that aside, and Macquarie, Commonwealth and NAB are all still growing their books, both investments and occupied lending, whereas the ANZ is still showing a fall in unoccupied lending compared with investment lending. So you can continue to see the different strategies that the banks are executing. But of course, it's all very much messed up by those big restatements from specifically Westpac this time around. There may be other smaller restatements, which I can't necessarily track, but this one was a real standout. So just to summarise then, we are starting to see the first signs of a turn in the market. And as the prospect of higher interest rates and indeed the slowing of house price momentum really starts to take, and remember, the consumer confidence is pretty low. My expectation is that we're going to see credit now coming off the recent peaks. And I would remind you that the rate of change of credit is the best determiner of what's going to happen to home prices. So it could well be that we see home prices beginning to move down. There was some data released today from the REA group. So as reported in news.com.au, house prices have slumped in a major reversal after the value of Aussie homes surged 25% during the pandemic, Sydney and Hobart have been worst hit by the fears of rising interest rates, with house prices falling in April for both capital cities, a new report has revealed. In Sydney, prices were down 0.1%, marking the first fall since early in the pandemic, while Hobart saw an even bigger drop, decreasing by 0.44% which is the first fall for the capital city since early 2018, according to the PropTrack Home Price Index report. Property prices stalled nationally in April, rising just 0.13% month on month and growing at the slowest pace nationally since May 2020. Price momentum in Sydney has slowed dramatically since mid-2021, with the annual price growth now half the pace seen only six months ago, as affordability continues to bite, with the median house in Sydney estimated now to be worth around $1.2 million, the report said. Prop track economist Paul Ryan said there were two factors currently influencing Australian house prices. Firstly, we have seen such extraordinary growth over the past two years, it just couldn't continue, and it's finally caught up with the increase in borrowing costs, he said. There's also a sharper inflation increase than expected, which means interest rate hikes. Six months ago, we were still debating if interest rates would go up in 2023 and 2024, and now expectations are that interest rates will increase by between 1 and 2 percentage points by the end of the year. Consumer prices have risen by an incredible 5.1%. Data released this week showed a record not seen in 22 years. Interest rate rises could also trigger a 15% fall in housing prices, according to the RBA analysis, which Mr Ryan said was a reasonable assessment, although note it didn't tell the full story. The RBA is responding to strong economic conditions with the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, and everyone is expecting wages growth, which means we will likely see a balance. While borrowing costs will be going up with rising interest rates, people's wages are actually going up and getting higher to balance that out, he said. Well, good luck with that. That's all I'd say. The last time we saw that happen was between 2002 and 2008, where interest rates increased quickly, but wages also increased, so we saw housing prices growth. But I'm not saying that's going to happen here, 
as it was one in a 30 year event. But it shows that it's not simple enough to look at just the effects of interest rates on housing prices. Strong conditions generally have a positive effect on house prices. Housing prices grew by just 0.05% in Melbourne in April and 0.04% in the ACT. The strongest performers in April were Darwin with a 0.53% jump in house prices and Perth, which grew by 0.45%. Brisbane prices rose by 0.22% and Adelaide saw an increase of 0.34%. Mr Ryan added that there was big tension in the property market for buyers, which is also influencing prices. There is a lot of uncertainty among buyers about where borrowing costs will be, and they don't have the certainty of people who entered the market this time last year, he explained. Those people were fairly certain that interest rates wouldn't rise for a couple of years, and they would have a few years to pay down the mortgage even if they stretch themselves a bit. Now buyers wouldn't want to overload themselves as repayments are going to be substantially higher in as little as six months' time. Nationally, house prices were up 16.05% year on year to reach a median value of 691000 the report also found. On the ground, particularly in Sydney, we are seeing quite strong falls already. So if you want to find out more about what's going on with regard to property particularly, why don't you join me and Edwin on Monday for our property rant, where we'll go into the statistics in more detail. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.